Russia says it has successfully tested a nuclear-powered cruise missile. Russia just tested its nuclear-powered Burevestnik cruise missile, a weapon so ambitious that even its name, meaning Storm Petrol, sounds like a myth. On paper, it has limitless range and near-apocalyptic potential. Vladimir Putin calls it invincible. His own general calls it a flying Chernobyl. Both descriptions are right in their own way. The Burevestnik is perhaps the most dangerous weapon Russia has ever built, not because of what it can destroy, but because of what it already has. A weapon born from Cold War nostalgia, revived from Soviet blueprints, and responsible for one of the worst radioactive disasters of the 21st century. This is the story of the 9M730 Burevestnik, also known by its NATO name, Skyfall. A missile with near-infinite flight time, a trail of radioactive wreckage, and a purpose even Russia itself can't clearly explain. The timeline begins decades ago, long before Putin's era. According to Professor Mark Galliotti of the Royal United Services Institute, these new systems have their origin in Soviet times. They've been taken off the shelves and given new investment. The Soviets once dreamed of nuclear-powered flight, and when Putin rose to power in the early 2000s, that dream, long abandoned by others, was given new life. Around 2001, as the United States withdrew from the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, the Kremlin quietly restarted this forgotten project. Russia's goal was audacious. Build a nuclear-powered cruise missile that could fly indefinitely, bypass every defense system, and strike any target anywhere on Earth. It was meant to be the ultimate deterrent, a ghost missile that never needed refueling. To understand why Russia tried this, you have to look at the limits of traditional weapons. Conventional missiles burn chemical fuel and run out eventually. Their range is finite. The Burevestnik, powered by a miniature nuclear fission reactor, isn't supposed to stop. In theory, it can launch, circle the globe multiple times, change course mid-air, loiter above a target for hours, and strike whenever ordered. The technology behind it is as extraordinary as it is terrifying. A ramjet engine sucks in air during flight, forcing it through a chamber where the onboard nuclear reactor heats it to extreme temperatures. The heated air expands violently and blasts out the rear, propelling the missile forward. Theoretically, it never needs to land, but theoretically is doing most of the work here. Because while it sounds revolutionary, the United States already tried this exact idea nearly 70 years ago, and abandoned it for good reason. In the 1950s, American engineers were obsessed with nuclear propulsion. The Air Force launched the Aircraft Nuclear Propulsion Project. Researchers Frank E. Rom and Eldon W. Sams of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics were among the first to explore nuclear ramjets. Around the same time, the US Atomic Energy Commission began studying nuclear rockets for intercontinental missiles. On January 1, 1957, a new initiative, Project Pluto, was born. The US Air Force and the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory in California were tasked with creating a supersonic low-altitude missile, or SLAM, powered by a nuclear ramjet engine. The work was immense. Entire new facilities were built to contain the radiation risks, including Building 2201, a concrete fortress with eight foot thick walls, four foot thick lead glass windows, and its own fallout shelter. There was even a dedicated railroad to move radioactive parts safely. The cost reached $1.2 million then, about $12 million today. Every bolt, every screw had to be perfect, because one mistake could irradiate the Nevada desert. Despite the danger, the project succeeded, partly. Two prototype engines, Tory 2A and Tory II C, were tested in 1961 and 1964. Both worked, but success came with a terrifying catch. The unshielded reactors spewed radioactive isotopes like cesium-137 and iodine-131 into the air. The missile's exhaust was literally a stream of nuclear waste. By July 1964, the Pentagon cancelled Project Pluto. Three reasons sealed its fate. First, intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs, had evolved faster than anyone expected. They could fly farther, faster, and with greater precision, making nuclear cruise missiles redundant. Second, the environmental risk was staggering. A single flight could poison everything along its path. Third, the engineering challenges were endless. Radiation corroded materials, electronics malfunctioned, and any crash would have been a catastrophe. The US concluded that nuclear-powered flight was simply too 
too dangerous to pursue. That was the lesson Putin ignored. In 2001, Russia pulled those same old blueprints from Soviet archives, confident it could do what even the United States could not. But what followed wasn't triumph, it was tragedy. The Burevestnik began testing in the 2010S. From the start, it was a disaster. In November 2017, a prototype launched from the Pankovo test range on Yuzhny Island. It lasted two minutes, covered just 21 miles, and crashed into the Barents Sea. Several more tests went wrong the same way. Malfunctions, lost control, reactor failures. At least half a dozen missiles now lie at the bottom of the White Sea, leaking tritium and cesium into Arctic waters. Every failure spread radiation across fragile ecosystems, but the Kremlin, as always, stayed silent. Then came the propaganda push. In March 2018, Putin took the stage during his State of the Nation address, unveiling the Burevestnik as proof that Russia was unstoppable. His words were grand, his evidence non-existent. We started to develop new types of strategic arms that do not use ballistic trajectories at all when moving toward a target, and therefore missile defense systems are useless against them," he declared. One of them is a small-scale heavy-duty nuclear energy unit that can be installed in a missile like our latest X-101 or the American Tomahawk, a similar type but with a range dozens of times longer, basically an unlimited range. He went further. It is a low-flying stealth missile carrying a nuclear warhead, with almost an unlimited range, unpredictable trajectory, and ability to bypass interception boundaries. It is invincible against all existing and prospective missile defense systems. But behind the speech's animations and applause, the reality was bleak. The Bura Vestnik wasn't ready. It barely flew. Its failures were being buried, literally, under Arctic waters. And one year later, Putin's obsession would kill his own scientists. August 8, 2019, the state central navy testing range near Neonoxa on the White Sea, Russian technicians were recovering a crashed Burevestnik from the seabed. During the operation, a liquid-fueled booster linked to the missile's nuclear core detonated on contact with air. The explosion was instant and fatal. Five specialists died immediately. Several more succumbed to radiation sickness days later. Witnesses described symptoms of acute exposure, necrotic burns, internal bleeding, and organ failure. Rescue workers, unaware of the radioactive danger, were also exposed. The fallout spread across the region. Sensors detected spikes of strontium-91, barium-140, and lanthanum-140 in the air. In Severodvinsk, nearly 19 miles away, gamma radiation levels surged to 20 times normal levels. Residents were told not to open windows. For days, official information was suppressed, while Russian media reported a failed rocket test. In truth, it was one of the worst nuclear accidents in modern Russia. Even that didn't stop Putin. When meeting the victim's widows, he offered condolences and a chilling promise. We will certainly be perfecting this weapon regardless of anything. In other words, no disaster, no death toll would halt him. Work continued. Engineers rebuilt prototypes, refined reactors, and kept testing in secret. Putin announced the long-awaited success. Standing beside General Valery Gerasimov, he declared that the Bura Vesnik had completed a 14,000 km test flight, roughly 8,700 miles across the Arctic. I clearly remember, Putin said, that when we announced the development of this weapon, even very high level, top class specialists told me the goal was worthy but unattainable. And now crucial tests have been completed. Obviously, substantial work remains to place this weapon on combat duty, but the key objectives have been achieved. He smiled and added, this is a unique product that no one in the world has. General Gerasimov, however, called it what it really was a tiny flying Chernobyl. Around the world, experts reacted with alarm. Jeffrey Lewis, a nuclear non-proliferation expert at Middlebury College, warned, this is a bad development. It is one more science fiction weapon that is going to be destabilizing and hard to address in arms control. Former US Navy SEAL Team 6 leader Chuck Farah wrote in the Kiev Post, in reality, the Burevestnik represents a Frankensteinian folly a revival of a doomsday concept the United States abandoned decades ago as dangerous and unworkable. 
In a desperate bid to project power amid mounting battlefield defeats and economic isolation, Russia has grown perilously irresponsible, resurrecting this Frankenstein's monster at the cost of lives and legacies. Farah noted that the unshielded design will never be safe or reliable. The Burevestnik is not a strategic asset, but a useless, dangerous, and deadly stunt, its very flight path a toxic scar on the fragile Arctic environment. Then came the bluntest response of all, from the US President Donald Trump speaking aboard Air Force One. When asked about the test, he said, They know we have a nuclear submarine, the greatest in the world, right off their shore. So I mean, it doesn't have to go 8,000 miles. And they're not playing games with us. We're not playing games with them either. We test missiles all the time. I don't think it's an appropriate thing for Putin to be saying either, by the way. He ought to get the war ended. A war that should have taken one week is now in its fourth year. That's what he ought to do instead of testing missiles. Trump's message was clear. America does not fear Bura Vestnik. For all its grandstanding, Russia's so-called invincible missile has caused more harm at home than it ever could abroad. It is a weapon that kills Russians, poisons their seas, and terrifies their scientists more than their enemies. And while Putin parades his limitless range on state television, his army continues to lose ground in Ukraine. His economy contracts under sanctions, his people protest, and his military, once feared, is now mocked for its failures. The Bura Vestnik was meant to show strength. Instead, it shows desperation. A relic of Soviet ambition reanimated by a leader who cannot accept decline. A weapon designed to fly forever, but one that will never truly arrive. So what happens next? If Russia keeps pushing the Bura Vestnik program, more tests will mean more radiation, more risks, and possibly more deaths. And for what? A weapon the rest of the world sees as obsolete, unworkable, and suicidal. Putin calls it invincible. But in truth, the Buravesnik may be his most visible failure yet, a radioactive monument to hubris. Now the only question left is how far he'll go before it crashes again. 